We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades <laughs> Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Modrovics. Joining me today is Jeff Christian, managing partner from the CPM Group. Jeff, thanks for joining me today. It's a pleasure, Tom. So you guys recently released the 2024 Gold Market Outlook, and that's a deep dive into the gold market based on collecting this data for over 30 years here. So Jeff, maybe we could start by going over a little bit about how long you personally and the group in general has been collecting this data and the kind of perspective that that ends up giving you. Okay. Well, CPM Group originally was the research department at J. Aaron and Company. And J. Aaron was one of the 12 largest precious metals trading companies in the world back in the 70s and 60s when commodities trading was still primarily done by partnerships that focused on commodities trading. Uh, and, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, there was this whole move to what they called financial supermarkets, where companies started, you know, uh, stock companies and bond companies started merging with each other, and they were buying commodities trading companies. Um, and um, J. Aaron merged into Goldman Sachs in November of 1981. Uh, but J. Aaron in the late 60s, early 70s, created a, a research department because the gold market the gold standard was ending and the era where silver was an integral part of the U S and other currency systems was also ending. You know, uh, we had silver certificates and we had silver in coinage and starting around 1960, 61, the U S treasury had to get out of that because there was upward pressure on the price of silver beyond the $1 conversion uh, price for an ounce of silver with silver certificates and a dollar twenty nine for melting down coins and extracting the silver. Um, and Aaron, Aaron said, "You know, let's have a research department because the gold market's going to be opening up, silver market's going to be opening up." And they created this market, uh, this research department that went around the world and talked to mining companies and smelters and refiners and fabricators and semi-fabricators and industrial users and jewelry manufacturers and institutional investors and central banks and everybody else that was involved in gold and silver. And and they, a lot of them were trading counterparts, um, and they developed the capacity to estimate supply and demand for gold and silver. And the idea was that these are incredibly asymmetrical markets. There's a tremendous lack of good information. There's a tremendous amount of bad information, some of which is just, you know, people just don't know what they're talking about, or they have belief systems, or in some, in many cases, uh, they will outright lie to you about what's going on, or they just won't tell you because there's nothing there. Mining companies will tell you how much they're going to produce because they're public companies and they have regulations that they have to disclose this information and they want investors to, to think that they're a good company, so they do it. But refiners, smelters, fabricators, investors, and back then central banks had no economic incentive to disclose what they were doing in the precious metals markets and they had economic disincentives for having that known. So, you know, let's not talk about that. <clears throat> and Aaron built up this research department. Meanwhile, I was a kid. Uh, I went to university. I was studying journalism and international politics, international economics. I was very much interested in how communist countries traded internationally and how developing countries traded internationally. And a lot of that was commodities oriented. Got out of school, went to work as a business journalist, uh, was doing electric vehicle research. I uh, wrote a book on electric vehicles. I was doing energy market research and commodities research as a journalist. And that and would have been late 70s early 80s yeah 1978 to 1980 okay. in 1980 i i went over to j aaron and 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 started running their research department and i started doing that in 1980 then in 81 we were bought by goldman sachs it closed in november 81 i became the head of commodities research at goldman sachs i didn't really like it there 
I had a number of reasons why I didn't want to stay at an investment bank or a brokerage house or, or a trading company. And so in 1986, when I saw that Goldman was kind of hemming and hawing about being in commodities in general and precious metals in general, specifically, I broached them with the idea that I could spin off the commodities research department, give sell them the research as a consultant, uh, reduce their exposure and their costs, and then I could be an independent research co company. So I did that. We created CPM Group 38 years ago, and we've been doing this ever since. So the the the, the reports, you know, and this is our last year's gold yearbook. The reports have been produced since the early 70s by J. Aaron and then Goldman Sachs. And then since 1986-87, uh, they've been produced by CPM Group. And we are independent research company. We don't sell, we don't promote precious metals per se. You know, we're not one of those companies that provide uh, data to promotional organizations. Hey, you should be buying gold. We do do that. We have uh, wholesalers and retailers who buy our research and circulate it to their clients. Uh, but that's not our main business. Our main business is getting the markets right. Mm -hmm. And we have this network globally of contacts where we gather data and we come up with estimates of supply, demand, and price. Mm -hmm. And the fact that our price projections, and we've added platinum group metals and we do base metals and we do specialty metals and critical metals and energy metals and oil and gas and agriculture, we do all commodities. Uh, and our track record in projecting prices is really good. And that track record is predicated, it's based on our fundamental research, our estimates of supply and demand, and our projections of where they're going, and our macroeconomic uh, top-down, you know, what's the environment in which precious metals and base metals and everything else is going to behave. Uh, so that track record being good sort of tells us maybe our supply-demand data is pretty good, pretty accurate, too, because if you put garbage into the system, you're going to get bad price projections. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate your perspective on these things, and that's why I wanted to ask you that question. So, you know, based on that, you know, this list of contacts and this experience, Jeff, how high is gold demand in the world right now, let's say over the last two or three years? Yeah, it's a very interesting thing because over the last three years, you've seen uh, investors, net investment demand for physical gold. Uh 25, 26, 24 million ounces. That's a pretty high level. You know, when investment demands less than 20 million ounces, as it was like in 2015, 16, 17, the gold price tends to be flat to lower. When investors are buying more than 20 million ounces, the gold price tends to rise. And when they buy more than 30 million ounces, the gold price tends to rise very quickly. So, over the last three years, we've seen investors buying 25, 26, and then last year about 24, 25 million ounces. Uh, and the gold prices moved from strength to strength. We've had record annual average gold prices every year for the last four years. And, you know, a big increase. I mean, in 2000, I think the average gold price was about 37% higher than it had been in 2019. And it's continued to make new highs ever since then, 21, 22, 23. Our expectation is it's going to be 24, 25. You're going to continue to see that. And I'm sure we'll talk about that, you know, and why. Uh, but, you know, the, the reality is that investors worldwide have been buying a lot of gold. There have been periods of time when there's weakness. For example, in 2022, from April through November, you saw a tremendous lack of interest in gold in China. That turned around in the final two months of 2022. And in China, you saw a stronger demand last year. Right now, you're seeing pockets of weakness in North America among institutional investors or high net worth individuals, uh, and also in India. But that's really, to be specific, that's like in the last month or so. You know, we and, and it, it probably is directly related to the fact that you've had record gold prices in dollar terms uh, and in rupee terms. And that has caused some investors to say, let's stop chasing the price higher. Let's see if the price comes off in second, third quarters. Um, and, and you know, it's not that they've gone away. It's just that they don't want to pay $2,200 when they were paying 
2050 uh, three months ago. Absolutely. It's interesting to, you know, hear those differences, but yet, you know, see that demand really across the board is so strong yet. So what were the, let's say the main macroeconomic drivers over the last year that were really pushing investors and institutions into gold? And I'd like to separate China away from that at this point. It's really an interesting time. And you're seeing that now, but you also saw it over the course of 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had, let's be honest, we, we've seen inflation coming down over the course of 2023, slowly but surely. Uh, there are pockets of inflationary pressures. There are pockets of deflationary pressures. Uh, but we've seen inflation coming down. We've seen interest rates hang up higher. Uh, and and to, again, you have to put it in context. You know, interest rates have risen 5%, uh, but they are still lower than they were for most of the period from the late 1960s through 2007, 2008. And it's really since the global financial crisis and the Great Recession that we saw, you know, a long period of 25 basis point interest rates. So they've risen up to 5%, but 5% is actually low by historical standards. But mm -hmm. you've seen interest rates stay high. You've seen corporate bond markets do well. You've seen inflation coming off. And you've seen economic activities much stronger than a lot of people thought. And the gut reaction that a lot of people have is, well, that's not the time when people would be buying gold. Don't buy people buy gold when they're afraid of the economic circumstances or they're facing high inflation and 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 uh, falling stock market and and recessionary economic conditions. Uh -huh. And the answer is yes, they do, but they also buy gold a lot of times in the late stages of an economic recovery. They're doing well. They've got a job. Their income may be increasing, at least in nominal terms, if not real terms, and their stock market portfolio is doing very well. And they're looking down the road and they're saying, this can't continue. So what we've seen over the last 18 months, 15 months, and it's accelerated over that period of time, really the, the last four months of last year and, and the first three months of this year, is investors buying a lot of gold and silver based on the view that these are the good times and let's take some money out of my stock and bond portfolios and put it into gold and diversify myself because probably this isn't going to last. So Jeff, just to let's say get it out of the way or, or make it explicit, what is your guys's gold outlook for this year into next? We, yeah. Our view, as I said, we've seen record gold prices over the last four years. Our view is that we're going to see record gold prices over the next two years, 24, 25. We're looking for maybe a 10% increase in the annual average price of gold this year, maybe even more. It averaged $1,953 last year. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for a much higher average gold price this year. Uh, and then we're looking for even higher gold price next year. And then it comes off. Mm -hmm. You know, and and we're probably, you know, we had a very dynamic increase in gold prices in 2024, 2025 that we've been projecting for several years. And we've been telling our clients that's when it's going to really rise sharply. And that has to do with our expectations on the economic and financial and political environment. But we lowered that because we started thinking, well, maybe the recession that we expect to emerge late 24 early 25, will be less severe than we had thought. Mm -hmm. But now we're probably increasing our projections based on the fact that, as I said earlier, we're seeing a lot of investment demand in good times. And if you're seeing investors buying so much gold that they're pushing gold to a record price, two, two new record highs on an intraday basis in March alone, and we're like $7 shy of, of it, I'm just looking at the price. Um, it went off my screen. Uh, we're we're seven dollars off of last year, last week's record gold price. You know, you're seeing investment demand strong enough to push gold to record highs twice this month in good times. Mm -hmm. So, if these are good times, what happens to the investment demand and gold price when things 
actually start getting worse. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we think that the gold price will probably rise sharply again, second half of this year into 2025. You know, Jeff, you mentioned this recession and many people thought that this was going to happen last year. Of course, you were one of the ones that was saying that we weren't going to get a recession last mm -hmm. year. So what are the the main things that you're taking into consideration to project this recession? And is it going to be as bad as, let's say, 2008 or 2020? I don't think it'll be as bad as 2008, 2011, that period. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we do think that it'll be worse than, say, 1991 or 2001. Uh, and it'll probably be precipitated by a combination of factors. Usually there's no one factor that causes a recession to emerge. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a gruesome misconception. A lot of people focus on monetary policy. Monetary policy these days sort of is beholden to fiscal policy. And what we tell people is you have to look at the real economy, the real supply and demand for goods and services and how that's going. Inflationary pressures, labor pressures. Labor tends to lag inflation, by the way. Um, and then fiscal policy. Uh, we've had an extremely stimulative fiscal policy, not only in the United States, but on a global basis for the last four years. Uh, and that there's pullback from that. And that fiscal policy has been sugar high for the economy, uh, and, and we're probably going to come down from that sugar high. Uh, and then you look at constraints in the real economy, supply and demand for goods and services. Monetary policy right now sort of follows those things. So there's a lot of people right now who keep talking about they, they're wishing for lower interest rates. And that's like the last thing you should wish for. because Look, if you have strong growth, strong labor market, and declining inflation at 5% interest rates, uh, there's no reason to lower your interest rate. Hey, the Fed's succeeding. This is a good interest rate. It's not killing the economy. The economy is relatively strong, and it's, it's helping to quell inflation on a long-term basis. The Fed will only lower interest rates when things are really scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you see the Fed lowering interest rates, that's the time you should be worried. You shouldn't be happy. You shouldn't be wishing for lower interest rates because they will only lower interest rates when the economic environment is much more hostile than it is today. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that these rates at this time, let's say, considering the economic conditions we're under, are sustainable at this point? These rates are sustainable. And as I said, you know, if you if you think about it and you should not think about it, uh, you know, what we're doing is we're actually moving toward a more normalized interest rate. Interest mm -hmm. rates, as I said, were above 5 percent on a nominal basis for most of the period from the late 60s into 2008, into the Great Recession and, glo uh, and, and global financial crisis. And they only fell after that. And the Fed and other central banks have talked for a, more than a decade now about normalizing uh, interest rates. We've written last year about how that we think that's the wrong way to look at it. What you what you should look at it is we're entering a third era of post-war interest rate behavior. You know, we had that period from the '60s through into the '80s, uh, and and the global recession and the global financial crisis changed that. And we had this extended period of time of zero interest rates or very low interest rates or negative uh, interest rate policies. That's ended. And now you're going into a third period. But that third period probably isn't a return to the pre-2008 period. It's probably something completely new. Now, that raises issues because Uncertainty is not the friend of anybody. Mm -hmm. So you have a tremendous amount of uncertainty, not only with investors and consumers and companies making investment plans, but also with monetary policy experts. Yeah, we haven't been here before. We don't know exactly where we are in terms of economic activity. And, and you know, there are, economic theorists, and then there are people who 
are empiricists. And we tend to be empiricists. And we say, you know, let's not look at a theory. Let's not try to create a theory or find a theory that explains what's going on. Let's look at the data. What's actually going on? And what does it maybe tell us about what to expect going forward? Mm -hmm. So what do you see as the path forward for the Fed, let's say for 2024, 2025? You know, it seems that fighting inflation requires rates to be this high or higher yet. And on the other side of that, we have a significant amount of debt that needs to be rolled over this year at much higher rates than they were issued at. So how do we kind of square those two things, Jeff? You know, obviously you already mentioned the idea that the Fed will be reacting to some type of negative event if they bring interest rates down. So how do we kind of square those things? Yeah, there's a lot of conflicting pressures right now. Mm -hmm. And that's it. the first thing is there are inflationary pressures. And inflation has come down. If you look at the core inflation versus headline inflation, headline has come down faster than core because of a decline in oil and gas prices. That's a very volatile sector of the economy, and it can turn around very quickly. Uh, so you have to worry about that. If you strip that out and you look at core inflation, you've had a lot of inflationary pressures persisting in housing and in services. Uh, and, and those are much more problematic. They're not the kinds of things that you change with monetary policy. They have to do with that real economic activity and fiscal policy. And fiscal policy has not been a friend of the overall economy for a long, long time in the United States. And so we have a housing industry that does not respond to the housing demand, the requirements of housing consumers. You know, you have people building McMansions because they have a wide, uh, a higher margin at the expense of not building smaller uh, housing for first time buyers, starters, uh, younger people, and empty nesters. And you can see the same thing in the auto industry. Now, auto and housing are the two most interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy. So that's a real problem. But the core problems aren't interest rates. It's the structural imbalances between the supply and demand of housing and autos uh, going on. So that's a real problem. You know, that, that's one of the factors. In terms of the rising debt, it's interesting because like one of the things you'll see is like a lot of gold promoters and doomsday guys. Are there. Well, the world's dumping U.S. Treasuries. It's mm -hmm. not. In fact, the outstanding balance of Treasuries has never been higher. And the amount of Treasuries held by overseas investors is at a record level, more than eight trillion dollars. Yeah, up 10 and a half percent from the end of 2022. No one is dumping treasuries. And, and I'll get back to that in a second. The same is true with the dollar. The dollar is not collapsing. Central banks are not dumping the dollar. What they have been dumping is the euro. And we can talk about that if you want. But the thing is, and the thing that these guys maybe don't understand, or maybe they understand and they just ignore it, the treasury securities are one of the least risky assets in the world, and as is gold. Gold is probably the least risky, and U.S. treasuries are probably the second least risky. And these are the two asset classes that people turn to when they're worried about what's happening and what's going to happen in the future. And what you're seeing over the last three years is investors moving out of other debt moving out of other assets into U.S. Treasuries. Yeah, people say, well, the Treasury market's going to collapse. Treasury market will be the last debt market to collapse because it's the least risky. Mm -hmm. and what you're seeing is a lot of investors and others and governments around the world saying, I don't really necessarily want to own the sovereign debt of XYZ company, country. I'd rather own U.S. Treasury sovereign debt you know, and gold. So you're seeing this move that is predicated on expectations of hostile financial market conditions and financial industry instability. And there are a lot of long-term structural changes in the global financial marketplace that, again, heighten uncertainty, heighten, uh, make it much more difficult to predict what's going to happen. 
Uh, and and so what you're seeing is in the treasury, in, in the debt market, you're seeing people move to treasuries. In the gold market, if you look at last year, you had about 6 million ounces come out of gold ETFs, but 24, 25 million ounces of physical gold bought. Mm -hmm. Now, ETFs are physical gold. Right. But what you're seeing there is that that seeming disconnect is ETF investors are saying, I still want to have exposure to gold, maybe, but I don't want to have exposure to those financial market intermediaries. I mean, an ETF is a share of an offshore company that is uh, holds gold and is administered and managed by financial institutions. And so if you go back to 2022, early 2023, you saw ETF, the smaller ETFs and the ETFs run by smaller financial institutions, people were selling them, but they were moving the gold into the larger ETFs. But then in the second half of last year and the first part of this year, you're seeing them get rid of those too. And that may have, that may reflect, you know, the, the collapse of Credit Suisse, you know, People in the United States keep talking about the three regional banks that closed last year that had financial problems that closed. But on a global basis, Credit Suisse also failed. And that was specific deal, you know, that was specific stuff that had to do with the, the Saudi uh, royal family screwing them over. But that's beside the point. Uh, you know, you're seeing investors and central banks and others around the world say, I have to worry about my exposure to the financial system. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why they're buying gold. It's one of the reasons why they're buying treasuries. It's one of the reasons why the dollar is held up as well as it has uh, against other currencies. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I wanted to get your thoughts on if you think that the global debt or let's say, let's let's take a step back, U.S. debt and deficits are a problem going forward or considering that the U.S. can you know, basically print at will to pay these debts if that ends up being an issue or as big of an issue as it's made out to be. U.S. debt and deficits, federal, state, private, are problems. They are big problems. Uh, but you have to put the problem in the context. You know, U.S. federal debt right now, $34 trillion. That's an enormously scary number. I remember when I started in this business, federal debt was less than a trillion dollars, and the deficit was about $54 billion. And Ronald Reagan was saying, we can't support this. This is, you know, this is going to collapse. You know, and you had various people, some of whom are still saying that the Treasury market's going to collapse, saying the Fed, the Treasury is going to collapse in 1980-81 with a $58 billion deficit and a trillion dollar debt. Now we're at $34 trillion. But if you look at that $34 trillion and you say, okay, what percentage of U.S. GDP is it? It's about 120, 123%. And it's U.S. Treasury debt, relatively risk, uh, lower risk. Look at it on a global basis, throw in private debt as well as government debt, and you have total global debt that is more than 300% the size of global GDP. None of which has the creditworthiness of U.S. Treasuries. So what that means is as I said, you've got a lot of people dumping that stuff, moving into treasuries, and that buys the treasury time. You still have a problem with the treasury debt, deficits and debt. It needs to be resolved, and there's no political will in the Congress or the administration to, to, to deal with it. It is a problem, but the fact that it is not as problematic as the global debt balance, imbalance gives the Treasury time and gives the Congress and the administration time to play their violin while while the world burns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I think it comes back to that idea of being the cleanest dirty shirt. And obviously, if that mm -hmm. applies for the Treasury market, that also applies for the dollar, right? Yeah. Right, exactly. I mean, look, the the the, the value of the dollar is, pre is is based heavily on foreign investors wanting U.S. dollars to invest in the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. Treasuries or currencies or real estate or companies, you know, and people worry about the trade deficit, but we have a trade deficit in part because we like foreign goods and services more than 
uh, foreigners like us, our goods. Um, can't imagine why. Um, but also because foreigners want dollars. So they underwrite our trade deficit by saying, I need those dollars to buy into the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and that supports the trade deficit. Like I said, you're buying time, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be fixing this stuff. Well, getting back to something that you kind of mentioned offhand there, why is demand dropping for the euro? Then? For the euro? Mm -hmm. Well, it is. And, and it's funny because, you know, again, you know, you, you hear people say how central banks are dumping the dollar. But if you look at uh, foreign exchange reserves of central banks, the dollar has been pretty stable around 60 percent of foreign exchange reserves for several decades. Um, so they're not dumping the dollar. But in our gold yearbook, we actually have the data and it shows you the euro as a percentage of central bank foreign exchange reserves has gone from like 29 percent to about 19 percent. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with the comparative economic advantages of the U.S. relative to Europe. It has to do with certain structural and political and cultural and social issues within the European Union and within the individual countries in, in the Eurozone. Uh, and it has to do with their proximity to Russia. Yeah. So those three factors have caused a lot of people to say, I'm overweighted the Euro if I have 29% of my assets in the Euro. Right. I'd like to get your thoughts, Jeff, as well on, you know, the dot plot shows that interest rates will come down maybe 100 basis points or so by the end of the year here. So does it matter why interest rates are being dropped? And that ends up changing the reaction to gold? Yeah, first off, the dot plot shows that Fed OFOMC members expect interest mm -hmm. rates to drop. You know, they don't, it doesn't mean it's a guarantee. It doesn't, it's not a guarantee. You know, and just like you know, people look at their their economic projections that they release on a quarterly basis, and they say these guys have been wrong, consistently wrong. It's like, yeah, they could be, they could be working for a Wall Street bank. You know, they've been so wrong on their economic projections. Uh, but um, it's very important why interest rates fall. And again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. The Fed's not going to cut interest rates until it sees a significant reduction in the strength of the US economy. It's only when they say these interest rates need to be reduced in order to help out the economy that they mm -hmm. will do that. Now, you could come up with other reasons why they might reduce their the interest rate uh, and, and they could have different implications for gold and for other financial assets. But that's probably the major factor there. And, and that's going to be very important. And of course, we have an election coming up this year. So how does, you know, the uncertainty of the outcome of that election play into the gold outlook for this year as well? Yeah, we've been saying for months now that, you know, over the long time, you know, free gold since 1968, um, economic and financial conditions have had a greater influence in determining investor interest in buying more or less gold uh, than political conditions. Uh, but that in 2024 and probably 2025 and maybe continuing, we think that political uncertainties and conditions will be more in the forefront of investors' minds. And you're definitely seeing that right now. A good economy, uh, well, it's not a great economy, but it's a good economy. It's bumping along. Things are getting better slowly but surely for a number of people. But there's a great deal of political uncertainty. And obviously, a lot of it has to do with the United States because it's the United States. It's the largest economy. It is the producer of the de facto reserve currency. 60% of central bank foreign exchange reserves are in dollars. Probably 70 to 80 percent of private sector global wealth is denominated in dollars. So the U.S. economy and the U.S. political stability is very important. Plus, we have the biggest military by far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
we pre- we spend more on our military budget each year than the next 10 countries combined. Mm-hmm. So we have this enormous uh, military too. And we have demonstrated over 250 years uh, the willingness to use it <laughs> to impose our will around the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're we're the big elephant in the room. But the reality is that more than half the people in the world are facing major elections this year. You have a move toward anti-democratic policies in many of those countries, including the United States. Uh, You have very important elections, not just in the US, but on a a global basis. And then you have a deterioration of international cooperation and an increase in international hostilities. So that political environment, not just the US election, And even within the U.S., it's not just the U.S. presidential election, it's the congressional election, but it's the broader dissolution of cooperation on a societal level. You know, America was predicated on tolerance, not necessarily acceptance, but tolerance. You know, I don't care what you're doing, just don't put it in my face and leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. Mm -hmm. And that tolerance has deteriorated, partly because certain groups of society wanted acceptance, tolerance wasn't good enough, but also for other reasons. There are other parts that said, no, I just don't want to tolerate these people anymore. They're different from me. Um, And there have been various forces that have fueled that and fired it on on both sides. And so it's not just the presidential election, it's not just the overall election, it's also just the deterioration of the social compact within the United States. And you're seeing that mirrored in other countries too. I personally find this to be an interesting question, but we'll see what you think. How big of a role do you think that the media plays in creating that divide and that, let's say, that lessening of tolerance to other people? Oh, it's a very big, it, it's very big. Uh, yeah, um, it's a very big thing. And, you know, we, we, we have this scandal at NBC right now. Uh, you know, the media has played a very big role in playing to stereotypes and divisions within the economy and focusing on negative factors. You know, I go home, my wife and I watch the news religiously. Uh, We watch an hour of news from six till seven, and then we watch an hour of news from 10 till 11, virtually every night. And I sit there, I've got the screen on in front of me all day, and I'm looking at news from around the world, and I'm I'm always giving her. I, I'm sure she hates me for it. A litany of other news that just doesn't get reported, you know. Um, and I think that the the mainstream media have played to those divisions, and then the new media have played even more to it. And to some extent, I think the mainstream media are playing off of that new media which, you know, looks at algorithms and says, oh, this is what you want to hear. This is what I'm going to give you. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's terrible. Uh, It's a very terrible thing. And again, you know, I I studied journalism in the 70s. I worked as a journalist in the 70s. Um, Journalism is not what it used to be. Absolutely. I, I can completely agree with that. Jeff, how much investment demand is being derailed, do you think, by Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? Very little. Um, and again, our gold yearbook has a whole section where we talk about cryptocurrencies being the antithesis of gold, uh, which they are. They're the exact opposite. If you look at the amount of money that's been distracted, one of the interesting things, and again, it's in our yearbook, you've had a steady increase in the dollar value of physical gold in the world. You know, it's it, it's relatively stable and it's been growing over the last 10 years or so. If you look at the market cap of cryptos, it's it's all over the place. It's like a ping pong uh, or a pinball machine. You know, it's less than a uh, trillion dollars and then it went to $3 trillion. And then within a year it was 800 billion and now it's about $2.6 trillion. Uh, it's all over the place. But the important, you know, that the one thing is the volatility and, and, and that, but the other thing is, 
the market cap, the outstanding. You're talking about a $2 trillion market for cryptos. You're talking about uh, uh, a gold market that has maybe twice as much outstanding and a much larger volume of trading activity, a multiple of it. And where you've really seen the money distracted from gold, if you want to say distracted, is stocks and bonds. Yeah, these are trillion, hundreds of trillions of dollars of outstanding stock and quadrillions of dollars of stock market derivatives. And the stock market has done very well. That's where a lot of the money is going that's not going into gold. So, you know, that kind of comes back to this, this idea of in good times, if there is such record demand and record gold prices, you know, how that ends up driving demand once things deteriorate. Right. Um, and it kind of blows your mind to think about what we could see out of a gold price in a situation like that. Right. You know, that as I think I was saying earlier, you know, we, our expectations of the gold price will be very strong, stronger than we had thought mm-hmm. in the second half of this year and next year, partly because it's already very strong in good economic times. So if this is how much gold investors want now, 24 million ounces last year, Mm -hmm. in good times, if things turn hostile, our expectation is that they might buy 28 million ounces or maybe even more than 30 million ounces next year, uh, depending on how hostile things get. So I think that that's one of the things. The other thing is like we've, you know, back in 2000, we issued a gold buy recommendation and we talked about what we called the golden re- renaissance, where investors would come back to gold and you'd see an upward shift in the investment demand curve with more investors buying more gold at higher prices for a longer period of time than ever before, and then joined later by central banks. And that's exactly what's happened since 2000. You started to see investment demand pick up in 2001, 2002, central banks uh those central banks that were selling some of their gold pretty much wrapped up those programs by 2007. Uh, 2008, you saw central banks that did not have a lot of gold because they had not accumulated gold during the Bretton Woods gold dollar standard uh, period where they were settling uh, uh, international trading capital flows with gold transfers. They started buying gold. So you've seen that golden re- renaissance. It's interesting because people ask us, Oh, will they ever compensate gold? No, they won't. When the depression occurred and gold, uh, people looked at the depression, they looked at deflation, and they took their money out of the bank and they bought gold. And most of it, a lot of it was gold coins at the time. And gold coins and gold bullion represented something like a third of the world's financial wealth. So when the people in the United States and around the world were taking their money out of investments, out of savings, and putting it into gold, they were killing the ability to fight the depression and deflation. So it made sense in 1934, 33, for FDR to call in the gold. And because it was a significant part. Now you have gold less than 1% of financial wealth. So calling in the gold would be meaningless. It would do nothing to help on a global basis. So there's no reason to confiscate the gold. It's not there. Now, that's the one thing. So you can just take that confiscation fear and flush it down the toilet. It's just nonsense. But the other thing is on a personal basis, on an individual basis, and on a collective investor basis, yeah, you could see investment demand go from 24 million ounces last year to 40 million ounces, which is roughly how much the world bought in 2020 during the lockdown. You could see, you know, I don't know what percentage increase that is, but that's close to 100% increase. Mm -hmm. Uh, You could see investment demand skyrocket. and Gold as a percentage of financial wealth might go from 0.6 to 1.2%. Mm-hmm. So it's not going to be consequential for governments and government financial policies, fiscal or monetary policies, but it could be very important for the gold price. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was exactly where I wanted to go was 
<laughs> you know, if you think that we could get back to 1% or 1.5%, but as you said, getting there doesn't necessarily mean anything consequential for governments, yet for the gold price, it will be extremely right. important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, again, you, you, you asked about, does it doesn't matter why interest rates might fall. And you should also ask why interest rates might rise. Mm -hmm. But the same is true with the gold. You know, you could have, okay, let's say that gold investment demand doubles, goes from 424 to 48 million ounces. The gold price goes ballistic, by which I mean it goes to 2,500 or maybe even $3,000, 10,000, 30,000, that's nonsense, you know. And it can't stay at that high because there is gold that could come into the market from any number of sources, um, mine production, scrap recovery, old jewelry, um, and um, above ground inventories of refined metal and bullion and coin form. So you say, okay, well, what would happen to cause investment demand to double? It would have to be a very severe political or financial crisis, maybe World War III. Yeah. Uh, it would have to be something really significant. At that point, monetary policymakers and government leaders would care nothing about gold. They would be focusing on the crises at hand. Yeah, you know, like, what are we doing here economically, financial market, militarily, politically, that's causing this panic? Not the panic that's driving people into gold, but the broader panic that's causing people to completely lose themselves and buy a lot of gold. And the fact that they're putting more money into gold is inconsequential compared to the bigger story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think that's an important point to make about these, let's say, these all time highs that we're seeing right now versus the ones that we have seen in the past. As you recently right. went over in your silver facts and fantasies, you know, $50 silver was what was that high reach for a matter of hours and then it had minutes. a yeah. minutes and then and then had yeah. quite a dramatic fall back down from that price the the mm -hmm. following day so it's not like you know most investors are going to be able to 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 be able to capitalize on a peaky high like that right exactly mm -hmm. i'd like to turn to talking about let's say China and and the developments that we've seen out of them. What do you see as the reason for their appetite for gold over the last several years? Well, I think there's a long-term appetite and interest in gold on the part of Chinese investors and the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. And it's not just you know limited to China, it's most of the world. And in the case of China, I think it's directly attributable to, let's say, the last 300 years of history. Yeah, most of it, I mean, until 1949, when the Communist Party took over and imposed some semblance of order on it, you had uh, decades and centuries of political disunion, civil war, domestic foreign invasions, the Japanese, others. Uh, you, you, had, you had a situation for hundreds of years where there was no financial, political, or economic stability in China to the point where the major currencies used for transactions were imported U.S., Spanish, and Mexican silver coins. Yeah. And so even after the communists took over in 1949, you had any number of people who said, oh, this is great, and maybe they'll bring some stability to this place, but at what cost? That doesn't mean I'm getting rid of my gold and silver. Yeah. So in 1949, Mao said, turn in all your silver. By 1955, the government said, okay, all the silver has been turned in. In 1980, when I went to Jay Aaron, I was looking at their customer base. And I said, well, you know, People's Bank of China, what do we do with them? Oh, we buy silver from them every month. Oh, where are they getting the silver? Oh, it's melted down coins. Yeah. Still. So... And the Chinese government has acknowledged this to its credit. And, you know, about 10 years ago, 
the government said private investors in China should own gold and silver. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure about the silver, but definitely on the gold. You know, and the, the, that was a risky thing for them to say because they're in essence saying, hey, you don't know what the future is going to bring. Now, the, 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 there are people in England and people in the United States and Canada who say that the U.S. and British and Canadian governments would never say anything like that because to say that investors should own gold is uh, tantamount to saying you shouldn't necessarily trust our currencies. Mm-hmm. Now, that's wrong because Britain, the United States, and Canada all make and sell gold, silver, and silver investment coins. You know, and do very well doing it. I mean, the British, uh, the United States and, and Canada are probably two of the four largest uh, countries making investment products, mm-hmm. uh, gold coins, official coins, uh, and the UK is up there too. So they do say that, but they don't broadcast it the way the Chinese did a decade ago. Right. Do you think that the, the Shanghai Gold Exchange is taking over pricing for gold because of the amount of demand over there? I don't know if it's taking over uh, the gold market. It's definitely taking market share. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we had you know, we had proposed to the World Gold Council that they re-domicile their headquarters to Shanghai, uh, maybe about eight years ago, and they stopped talking to us. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, the reality is there. Uh, the reality is that the the gold market globally is moving toward four nines gold, which is Shanghai. Mm-hmm. And and London has been hesitant to go from to four nines gold, you know, and and the, the 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 gold market, as I said, there's been this upward shift in the demand curve. You have more investors in more parts of the world free to own gold, buying gold for a longer period of time at higher prices. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and that's one factor. Another factor is that the modern financial system allows for decentralized trading much more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the idea that all commodities get traded in London and Liverpool or London and New York, uh, that's no longer necessary anymore. Well, considering that, Jeff, then why is there such a premium being paid in in the Shanghai Exchange over the West? Well, I think it, it reflects stronger demand. You know, as I said, we saw this massive, like 75% decline in gold fabrication demand and investment demand in 2022. And then the flip side was that you started seeing people rebuild their gold exposure in 2023. There's strong demand within China. Uh, the There was this buildup of 10 million ounces of unsold silver, gold in 2022 in, in China. The People's Bank of China has bought 9 million ounces of it over the course from November of 2022 through January of this year. Uh, So the gold market's tighter there. Um, And it's also more control. And you have a dirty float RMB. The, The currency is not as freely traded. So I think that all of those factors are there. The other thing is, you know, there's all this talk about how there's all the gold and silver has moved to Asia from London and New York and Switzerland. It's not true. Mm-hmm. You know, you have multiples of the amount of gold that's moved into China built up in Switzerland over the last 10, 20 years. Mm-hmm. So there's still a tremendous amount of gold. Uh, and the Swiss gold is readily available in the London market. There's still a tremendous amount of gold relative to demand in London and in New York relative compared to what you see in the Chinese market. So there are reasons why you would think that the national price might be at a premium uh, relative to the more liquid, currently more liquid London market. Mm -hmm. You know, we've spoken, Jeff, a lot about demand, but what about supply? How do supply numbers look right now? And are we still producing record amounts of gold? Well, the amount of gold that's being mined is down. Uh, somewhat from its peak. Uh, and that reflects the fact that the gold price had risen very sharply into 2011 and then came down. So you had a period of time where there was a reduction in the amount of 
money being spent on exploration and development of mines. Uh, with the higher gold prices over the last four years, you're seeing an increase in that, again, uh, more so in 2022 than in 2023, but still very high. So you're starting to see some increase in the amount of gold mining being developed and the capacity being developed. And that'll probably boost mine production somewhat over the next few years, assuming that the price stays high. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not going to be a runaway the way it was in the 80s and 90s. That, that was actually, you know, something I, I wanted to get your take on was, is there, you know, a, a fairly cyclical trend in CapEx exploration spending in the gold sector? And does that have any correlation to new supply being brought online? Yeah, there is cyclicality. And it's a terrible cyclicality because what happens is when the gold price is low, there is less money being invested in gold mining and ergo there's less money being spent in exploration and development. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to take five years to develop a gold mine, then it was 10 years, now it's closer to 20 years. So you you have this very, you, you have a need for long-term capital. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happens is as the gold price fluctuates, investors will underfinance the mining industry uh, at exactly the wrong time. You know, you really need to have a more stable pipeline of financing so that you have a more stable pipeline of exploration and development. But the capital markets in the United States and, and well, most of the world uh, don't contribute to that because it's very cyclical and very short-term in nature. Where you do see that is more so in China, uh, where they have a managed economy. So the government can sort of say, you know, you guys should be spending more money on exploration and development. How are all-in sustaining costs right now affecting miners? They've risen very sharply. They kind of started to plateau, I think, in the second half of this year, of last year. Uh, they're they're pretty high by historical standards. They're still pretty low compared to the market. You know, you probably have, you know, let's say $1,300 all-in sustaining costs on average. And probably 85 to 90 percent of the mining companies in operation uh, are very profitable at current levels. But uh, you know, uh, they there is a there is a decent profit margin for many mining companies. So if if that's the case, Jeff, do you have an explanation for let's say the lack of interest from investors and speculators in the gold miners? There's a whole range of issues that are there that have caused that. And one of the things, a lot of the issues have nothing to do with gold mining or mining in general. They have to do with changes in the equity markets mm -hmm. and institutional investors, in, in, in institutional investment markets and the broking markets. So you've had an equity market that has shifted away from investing in individual companies and they invest in index futures and index ETFs and index uh, notes instead. And those indices tend to only have the largest companies in them. So they kind of are skewed to it. And, you know, I, I think uh, I can't remember which agency uh, announced it this week. Uh, the, the gap between smaller companies, uh, stock performances and large companies has never been wider. So you've got an equity market that has ceased to be the source of capital for smaller companies, mm -hmm. including most mining companies. Uh, and, and so you just have a, a paucity of capital flows into the mining industry. There are some issues with in gold mining industry performance on a financial basis, not so much operating. You know, uh, we always talk about the there are two sets of performance metrics. One is operating. You know, are you operating a mine? Your mines profitably? If so, let's talk about that. And then there's the financial, which is what's happening in the stock market. Which and there's sometimes a very big disconnect between those two. Uh, but there are issues in the gold mining industry that uh, have caused investors to say, "I'm out of here." But most of the reasons why investors have 
pulled back from investing in, in mining companies is part of a bigger issue where investors have pulled back from investing in companies. Yeah, it's an interesting interesting shift to try and explain and figure out the reasons for. Jeff, is silver a part of a portfolio that plays a different role than gold? I think silver is pretty much uh, the same role as gold. Mm-hmm. It um, you know we talk about diversifying your diversification. So if you want to diversify your portfolio with precious metals, that's good. And then you want to diversify your portfolio of precious metals with some gold, some silver, physical metal, shorter term instruments, mining companies. So if, you know, depending on your wealth level uh, or if you're an institutional investor, you might want to have a portfolio that includes gold, physical gold, physical silver, but then also futures, ETFs, options and mining companies and a range of mining companies, too. So. but I think that silver is pretty much what it is, uh, very similar to gold in terms of its function in the portfolio. Mm-hmm. Do you think there are any good arguments for gold and silver to be considered strategic metals? Um, it depends on who's defining strategic or critical. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, governments and other people have very specific definitions of what a strategic or a critical metal is. And and part of it is that they are strategic or critical to either military or overall economic activities. Uh, and part of it has to do with their availability. How many countries produce the stuff? Or is it just a hand? You know, strategic and critical metals tend to have only a few countries producing a large portion of proportion of mine output. Mm-hmm. And many of those countries are seen by various other countries as being adversarial or quasi or potentially adversarial. So to be a critical or a strategic metal, also above, above ground inventories and available inventories. So to be a strategic or a critical metal, you have to have relatively scarce uh, mining capacity held mostly in adversarial countries or much of it in in adversarial countries without a lot of above ground inventories uh, and critical to economic activities uh, or military activities. And you look at gold and silver and by and large, they don't fit any of those criteria. You know, there's enormous above ground inventories of both. They're mined in dozens, you know, like 70, 80, 90 countries in the world. Uh, There's tremendous reserves and resources available to mine them. They can be critical in some applications, but there's ample supplies from stable sources. I mean, if you look at silver, you know, three of the largest mining countries in the world are Canada, the United States, and Mexico. So you've got a relatively stable. So you, it, it'd be very difficult to call these things strategic or critical. Mm-hmm. You know, financially or monetarily, they're very important. But, you know, um, it is, you know, there's been this story going around last year about how the Manhattan Project needed 146 million ounces of silver for its magnets and stuff. Mm-hmm. But if you go to the Oak Ridge website, which is where they were running this, uh, The reality is that they went to the government and they said, we need a whole bunch of copper for these magnets. And the government said, you know, we just entered World War One or Mm -hmm. World War Two. We can't give you any copper, but the Treasury has three trillion ounces of silver. So you go borrow the silver and use silver in instead of copper. So um, it wasn't that silver was this indispensable commodity. It was a substitute for a much more indispensable copper. Interesting. Yeah. And of course, for those that are curious, you and I spoke about the need for silver in bombs and things like that in our previous interview. So right. people can go back and watch that if they'd like to. But, you know, among these reasons to invest in gold, Jeff, do investors need to be worried about hyperinflation or the risk of CBDC is being introduced. Okay. Well, first off, hyperinflation, as economists define it, no, it's just not going to happen. I mean, this is like you know, fifteen percent a month 
for an ongoing basis. High inflation can be problematic. Uh, you know, if you look back in the 1970s, we had 13 or 14 percent inflation for a month or two, annualized rate uh, of inflation for a month or two. Uh, that's probably not going to happen. Our view is that deflation is probably much more worrisome than inflation over 10 percent at any given time. We think there are a lot of long-term deflationary pressures in the economy, uh, including computerized manufacturing, computerized other stuff, artificial intelligence, which is a grossly overused and misunderstood term right now. But you know, there's, there's a lot of long-term pressure on labor. Uh, there's an overcapacity of labor in the long run. There's an overcapacity of manufacturing capacity. Mm-hmm. Over capacity of commercial real estate, over capacity of retail uh, sales outlets. So there's a lot of deflationary pressures we'd be much more worried about than inflation, than high inflation, mm-hmm. let alone hyperinflation. In terms of central bank digital currencies, that again, that's like a straw man. And you know, if you think about it, it's very, very interesting because when bank notes were becoming more common late 18th century, early 19th century, there were people who said, oh, this is terrible. You know, I'm going to hang on to my gold and silver. And it actually made sense then because you didn't have telecommunications. So you could get bank notes that were written by a bank, a state chartered bank that had no auditing. You know, first bank of Canton, Ohio. And you go, you know, let's say you're a settler moving to Kansas. And you get there and they say, what's the first bank of Canton, Ohio? So when you moved or when you did for uh, long term, long distance transactions, you converted your currency, your paper currency into coins, mm-hmm. gold and silver coins. And you transferred those or you transferred the account of those to other people. When checkbooks came in 100 years later. The same argument was made. Oh, my God, this is going to destroy the monetary system. You got to hoard gold and silver. Yeah. When credit cards came in, same thing. When SWIFT was invented in the 1980s, I believe, same thing. Yeah. So central bank digital currencies are the next permutation of currencies, not money, but currencies. It's the next way of accounting for money or wealth Mm -hmm. and as such it's no real threat to uh, individual investors and holders of wealth and you know the the subset is oh and then they'll be able to look and see everything that you're doing and they can control where you're going to be spending your money etc that when i started going to london in business in the early 1980s One of the first things I learned was if you're going to buy Cuban cigars in London, you paid cash. Because if you used a U.S. credit card to buy tobacco products in England, the credit card company reported to the INS, hey, this guy's buying tobacco in London. Probably Cuban cigars. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the idea that the government and other entities uh, can look in on you because you're using central bank uh, digital currencies. That cat left the bag decades ago. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just crazy stuff. You know, it's like government's making all this deal about TikTok. And TikTok ought not to be owned by the Chinese because Steve Newton wants to buy it. Yeah. But TikTok and the Chinese can look in on everything that people are doing. But what about all of the other digital platforms, you know, Twitter, and I don't even know what's all out there, Facebook and and YouTube and everything else that are owned by U.S. companies that are looking into that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you you go online and you look at rosin for your violin bow, and by the time you get home, there's a special offer, two for one, on rosin. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like the extent to which the powers that be already know everything you're doing and know how to capitalize on it. That's there. Mm -hmm. CB, you know, central bank digital currencies are not going to make it worse. And only governments can make it better. Mm -hmm. But they, 
politicians get financed by the owners of those platforms. So that's mm-hmm. not going to happen. So do you think that, you know, if we do end up with CBDCs, that these Western governments have a different attitude towards them than, let's say, the Chinese government and, you know, keep that modicum of freedom in them and won't use them as a social credit score based control system as they do in China or as they have been reported to have been? It's already happening in the United States and Europe and Canada. Yeah, it, it's there. I mean, I think governments and corpor- large corporations have demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that you ought not to trust them to use your personal information in a responsible way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Jeff, I want to thank you very much for you know going through all of these questions with me today. For those that are interested, the 2024 Gold Yearbook is available on the CPM Group's website. It's a very in-depth look. We barely scratch the surface. There's all kinds of charts and you know excellent information in there. Jeff, do you want to leave our audience with anything before we wrap up here today? Yeah, you know, I encourage people to go to our website, cpmgroup.com. You can buy uh, the 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 yearbooks, gold, silver, and platinum group yearbooks are available as eBooks. You can order them and download them at our website. Um, and they are the Bibles and they'll give you information and history that you won't find anywhere else on these markets. Uh, and then you can always write to us at info at cpmgroup.com and say, this is my specific exposure to precious metals or commodities. How can you help me? Mm-hmm. And of course, you guys have a YouTube channel, CPM Group, where you do lots of excellent videos as well as the Twitter at CPM Group LLC. Jeff, right. thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.